Howdy! We are on chapter 19 of 25 chapters. So far, it's been a pretty intense semester. However, we're moving now from the technical skills to the non-technical skills. I don't like to use the word soft skills because sometimes people think they're less important. But what we're going to talk about now are more, there are some electronic aspects, by the way, but we're going to talk about more procedure, more, more things that you do that have to be outside of just the electronic aspect of cybersecurity. So as always, here is my attribution slide, and this chapter will be split into two videos. Now, many of you I know, or I'm guessing, were affected by either Hurricane Harvey or previous natural disasters. I have been through blizzards, which a blizzard is something like minus 20 wind chill, you know, uh, wind of a certain uh, speed, uh, snowfall of a certain speed. People say they've been in blizzards, but it, it's really technically not that many blizzards. I've been through the tornadoes. And last August, I had the unfortunate uh, experience of being through uh, Hurricane Harvey flooding my home with 12 inches. My point in telling you this is I learned a lot about how I had approached incident response and the like. Then I'm going to bring these lessons out. Uh, but I also want to emphasize this, that people misuse the term business continuity and disaster recovery as being synonymous. They are not synonymous. They are not synonymous. Business continuity means you've had something happen, but you are continuing operations. Disaster recovery means you, your operations have been suspended. It's catastrophic. You are having to rebuild. So keep that in mind. Here's our learning objectives. We're going to talk about business continuity plans, disaster recovery plans. We are going to talk about backups. Uh, you know, in today's technology, the cloud makes it so easy for backups. And we're going to talk about some other aspects of the electronic. So again, you need to know the difference between business continuity and disaster recovery. This is my analogy. This was uh, one of the uh, iconic pictures of Houston. Uh, I have some great pictures of uh, my house with 12 inches of water, my, my library books, uh, you know, just destroyed my, putting my feet up on the back patio at one point because I was like, well, there's nothing I can do but sit here in a flooded house. Whereas business continuity would be, oh, you've had a heavy rainfall and it's affected some of your records or some of your processing. So please use those terms correctly. They are basically a difference in scope. Now, as always, let's start with our definitions. So back out planning is part of a configuration change plan where steps are devised to undo a change. <clears throat> so back out planning means I did an electronic change. It didn't work as I intended. So now I have to do a backup plan. Okay, excuse me, back out plan. I need to figure out how to go back to our baseline typically. A business continuity plan is plans, uh, the plans a business develops to continue critical operations in the event of a major disruption. A business impact analysis, and you're going to start seeing these BIA words. When we talk about privacy, we're going to talk about PIA, privacy impact analysis, is analysis of the impact to the business of a specific event. So, for instance, uh, and this has to do with either disaster or business continuity, I had a friend who had a company. I would mention uh, he owns uh, liquor and stuff uh, and real estate. In fact, he has a franchise here in uh, the local area. And we could never convince him to back up his files on the cloud. And his servers flooded again in Harvey and came within probably about a half inch of totally being ruined, right? Because he had not done an analysis of the impact. What happens when he loses his electronic systems? What happens when he loses his data? What happens when he loses his in ability to invoice, monitor his business? A cold site is an inexpensive form of a backup site that does not include a current set of data at all times. So it takes longer to get operational, but it's considerably less expensive than a warm or hot site. A Delta backup is a type of backup that preserves only the blocks that have changed since the last full black backup. So I backed up last Wednesday, my system goes down on Friday, right? So I need to use the incremental or the Delta backup, uh, not from the 
from either the last full backup, so it's a recording of the transactions. Now, disaster recovery plan. Here's the difference. A written plan developed to address how an organization will react to a natural or man-made disaster in order to ensure the business survives, okay? It's related to the concept, but it is not synonymous. So you'll hear, I could have said to ensure business continuity. Big thing about the difference between disaster recovery and business continuity is in terms of scope. Is it a, is it a disaster? <laughs> One man's disaster might be another man's business continuity, but how bad was it? Does it disrupt operations or is it catastrophic? Fault tolerance is a characteristic of a system that permit to operate even when some components of the overall system fail. So you want a fault tolerance system, let's say, oh, in a nuclear power plant and something that you don't want the system to just fail and leave uh, at a risk. So you want it to fail gracefully. You can think of it that way. Uh, so the characteristic of the system that permit it to operate even when subcomponents fail. A full backup is a complete backup of all the files and structures. Uh, high availability refers to the ability to maintain high availability of data and operational processing despite a disrupting event. Now, if we were in a class and we were talking about high availability, I'd ask one of you, which type of systems need to maintain availability of data despite a disrupting event? Well, how about life support systems? Uh, how about certain systems that uh, underplay our critical infrastructure, right? You don't want the system to go down on the water treatment processing plant or the power grid and leave us, you know, dark and cold or dark and hot, depending on where the weather is. So it refers to the ability to maintain availability of data and operational processing despite a disrupting event. Hot site. Hot site is a different than cold site, obviously. It's a backup that's fully configured with equipment and data and is ready to immediately accept transfer of operational processing in the event of a failure. Here's where you need a hot site. I uh, did a consulting job, I, I don't know, two or three years ago with a company that um, had, uh, that, that did, excuse me, did disaster management and they sold their services and there was a, basically a communication systems to the government. In the event that their system went down, they had 15 minutes to bring it fully operational. That's not going to work with a cold site. Right? You need a hot site that basically mirrors what happens and can immediately take over in case the first site is compromised, destroyed, whatever. They, uh, the company was out of Silicon Valley in San Francisco. However, they had one of their sites, I think in Utah, and another of their sites further uh, in the east that worked as their hot site. Incremental backup is a backup model where files have changed since the last full or incremental backup are back, excuse me, since the last full or incremental backup. And a mutual aid agreement is an agreement between similar organizations where the organization agrees to assume the processing for the other party in case of a disaster. For those of you who are interested, these definitions do not include something called software escrow, but software escrow is still done where in case of a catastrophe and for some reason uh, I'm relying on a vendor and I can no longer get their software and it may not be just a natural disaster, it could be a business continuity problem if the company goes into bankruptcy, is where you escrow your software with a third party. If you're gonna ever have a software company, you're gonna to wanna to do this uh, to assure your clients if anything ever happens, it has to be an emergency. I can't just go get that software. I have to go prove uh, companies are bankrupt, the company's gone out of business, the company's no longer you know, answering the phones, the phones have been turned off, but I need their software to run my operations. That's called software escrow. Okay, recovery point objective is the amount of data that a business is willing to place at risk. And it is determined by the amount of time a business has to restore a process before an unacceptable amount of, time of data loss results from a disruption. We used to kind of overall oh, recovery point objective. Now with ransomware, we're looking more and more at these metrics. Recovery time objective is the amount of time a business has to restore a process before unacceptable outcomes result from a disruption. And redundant array of independent disk or RAID 
the array of disk arranged in a single unit of storage for increasing storage capacity, redundancy, and performance characteristics. I don't know. I'm out of this loop if people are still using RAID. Uh, so you have on-site backup with the prevalence of the cloud. And a warm site is between a cold and a hot site. It's a back-off site. Again, all these sites are off-premises, by the way, that has hardware that's not configured with data and it'll take some time to switch over. So cold, medium, hot. Cold is like it's there. you got to configure it. You're starting from ground zero. But hey, my data is not that important. If it takes me... 40 hours or a day or whatever. Medium is, well, it's kind of configured. It's not configured with the data. Let's say the hardware so, but you're gonna have to do your data loading from backups. And a height site means ready to go right now. I'm ready to go. So let's talk about business continuity. I put in red here what you need to know. I mean, not what you need to know, but what I emphasize among those things. So we talk about planning, doing a business impact analysis, identification of critical systems and components, single ports of failure, all of this. We'll talk about this. So business continuity, keeping an organization running when an event occurs that disrupts operations. Okay, so it's often used when discussing uh, continued operations uh, in the term of business continuity related to risk management and risk management best practices are associated with business continuity. So that is all cybersecurity is based on risk. But in reality, when I say that, I've owned small businesses, I've started small businesses, I've run small businesses for other people. Um, all business is based on risk, right? You develop a product and you make an investment, okay? So you're always managing risk. We're always managing risk anyway, just in our everyday life. You know, we wait for the red lights before we cross, uh, to, for red lights for oncoming traffic. We wear our seat belts. We do things uh, for risk management. So business continuity has to do with that. What are the risks? Can I have a power outage? What happens if I have a power outage? What if I have a weather event? Or what if one of my vendors goes bankrupt? Or what if the market changes? Business continuity encompasses more than just cybersecurity, although that's what we're focusing on here. So we need a plan. You need a plan, you need a plan in writing, period. End of discussion. Uh, plans are no good unless they're in writing. It's like processes. If people tell me when I go into companies, well, we tell people to do this, we tell people to do this. You know, my statement's always the same. Show me the plan. If it is not in writing, it does not exist. Same thing. Why do you want a plan? Because when things happen, you want to be able to rely on a common understanding of what to do. And in some cases, people panic. And so having a written plan will mean that they're going to have a checklist, that they're going to have processes in place. It's going to lead them what they need to do. So it's, it's just how do we continue operation? It's tactical, meaning I'm going to be telling you, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, on the processes, on the actual operation. It's going to look at the limited number of critical systems and short-term needs. So let's keep going. Let's put a Band-Aid on the wound and keep going to give us time to fix the problem. That's business continuity. Uh, as opposed to disaster recovery, which is like, I can't put a Band-Aid on the wound. <laughs> you know, it's a gusher. Uh, I need more uh, strategic and tactical uh, processes in place. So the form of a disaster recovery plan is on the recovery and rebuilding after a disaster has occurred. And again, typically we think of natural or man-made disasters, uh, you know, in terrorist events now, if you uh, are too young to probably remember 9-11 when a company called Cantor Fitzgerald lost something like 80 or 85 percent of their employees uh, uh, because they were in the World Trade Center uh, uh, operations. There hadn't been a thought of what if, what if, what if a terrorist attack. Um, so it's DRP, as it says, is a part of the larger picture. It's more strategic and a major focus is the protection of human life. We were lucky in Houston, we lost, I believe, less than, well, I think Texas lost less than 60 people in Harvey, which was incredibly low compared to the number of people at, let's say, in Katrina or something. So when you're in a disaster, what do you do? You change your focus. Uh, when water started to enter my house at 5.30 in the morning, luckily I was awake. At first I was taping the doors because I thought the water was going to seep in before the water started coming in every possible way, up through the floor, 
in the walls, uh, my dog door from the garage. I started to open the garage door and realized the garage had already flooded. Uh, and that, so I shifted my focus. My focus went from trying to tape and prevent the water from coming in to an, a realization that water is in my house at a rapid rate. Luckily, I have a room above my garage uh, that was an addition to my house. So my focus shifted from prevention to what can I protect? Get my pictures upstairs, get as much of my uh, stuff off the floor as I could, you know, get my artwork moved, whatever was I saw at risk that I could save. And I managed to save quite a bit, of course, not everything. So it's part of the larger picture. A major part of that is the protection of human life. In my personal experience, I wasn't worried about drowning. Uh, it was just that the water began to come in so quickly, 12 inches in a little more than an hour. And then it luckily for me stopped. Uh, because at one point I thought this is going to end badly. It's going to be two or three feet and I'm going to be upstairs. Um, so you, your focus switches, your energy kicks in, and that's the same thing in cyber operations and business or anything. You, you change your focus, you change your mission. First of all, you make sure everybody is safe and then you move on to how you can mitigate your loss. Now, business impact analysis is becoming more and more important, and I'll tell you why. We don't know how to do this very well. We don't know how to actually de de detail the specific impact of elements on a business operation. Let me give you an example. This past spring, Facebook had this issue with Cambridge Analytica. Now, okay, that's not a natural disaster. Did Cambridge Analytica do anything that broke U.S. laws? I have not found one that it did. However, it breached the trust between Facebook and its users, and Facebook had a, uh, I think uh, that the stock value lost billions um, in, in a few days from the loss of trust. Now, if I were doing a business impact analysis before this, would I have been able to foresee, hey, if this happens? Now, that's an extreme example, but there's a lot of things that happen that we can't we can't fully consider. It's not that we're not smart people. For instance, let me give you another example. I'm a manufacturer and I have a supplier for a critical part and it's been in business for years. We have a great working relationship and one day they go bankrupt or one day their quality goes out the window and I can't depend on it. But they're a single point of failure in my supply chain. The reason I'm using these business analysis, I don't want you just to think of BIA in the term of cybersecurity. I want you to think about this in the totality of business. And business is about making money. We live in a capitalistic country. We, we uh, as I as I record this now, I'm sitting in my TV room and it's muted, but CNBC is on and. Uh, the Dow has fallen and it's showing, you know, one, two, three, four, five different ways of data to look at this. And there's a commentator who's, you know, moving his hands and gesturing and I have no idea what he's saying. There's a, a live picture from Brussels at the G9. And, it, you know, in other words, we <clears throat> we are a capitalistic country. We, we need to make a profit in our business. So we BIA basically says, what are those things that will impact our profitability, our survivability? Okay. Companies don't don't stay in business if they're not making a profit. End of discussion. So what do we do in this in talking about cybersecurity now? We identify critical sisters and components. So this is an analysis effort, and this is why I don't like it called soft skills. It takes some real thinking. What is the understanding of the criticality of systems, the data, the components? Because as all environments are dynamic and this changes, you're constantly having to identify which systems are critical. And you remove single points of failure. <clears throat> single points of failure are bad, right? Uh, you can have 20 suppliers for one part and one supplier for another part. And if you lose that part, lose that supplier rather, you can't get your product out the door. Or uh, other things in software, for instance, uh, you're relying on a third party app uh, that Again, it's a single point of failure. If something breaks, it's going to impact you, even though it may be something that's going to break that you have no control over. You have to figure out how to remove that single point of failure. Electronically, people-wise, everything. Remember how we talked about the different aspects of cybersecurity is technical, operational, 
uh, and physical, same thing. You need to remove that single point of failure. And you need to do a risk assessment. And let me just give a shameless plug here. I teach a risk assessment course. Uh, all cybersecurity is based on risk. I've taught it once. I'm going to re-engineer it this summer um, because of how important risk is to cybersecurity. And at the same time, I admit in the first class that we can't account for all risk because it is difficult to foresee the financial impact. For instance, ransomware um, or a zero day attack that something like Stuxnet, let's say, which something happened for the very first time on an industrial control system. How do you foresee, how do you do all the risk? But what we find is if you go on and do a risk assessment, it does the analysis to better mitigate risk, to better plan for risk. One story that came out of 9-11 that I don't know if it's true or not, that when the uh, they had the city had put in a lot of planning for Y2K, when you know from 1999 to 2000, I know I'm speaking ancient history to many of you, and when uh, the planes hit the tower, a lot of companies went back to those plans because they had planned for some kind of disaster. No, it wasn't the same disaster, but they had something to fall back on. That's what risk assessment gives us. So here's my other shameless thing you need to know about risk. Risk can be avoided, <clears throat> it can be accepted, it can be mitigated, or it can be transferred. Okay, I avoid risk. I'm afraid of driving. I'm afraid of being, no, let's fly. I'm afraid of flying. So I avoid risk. I don't fly in a plane. Uh, I accept the risk. I'm afraid of flying, but I'm going to get on a plane. I'm going to buy insurance. I'm going to take some, you know, Valium. I'm going to put on my seatbelt. I'm going to be, uh, years ago, I'll never forget, I was on a plane with short flight to Oklahoma City, I think from Austin. And uh, there was this huge guy sitting next to me, looked like he'd been a pro football player. And he grabbed the arms of the, of the uh, seat as we took off and he started loudly praying the Lord's Prayer. And uh, when we were safely in the air, I said, sir, are you okay? You know, are you, uh, are you afraid of flying? And he goes, oh, I hate flying. And I said, oh, is this, you know, something about his flight? And he goes, oh, no, I fly every week. I thought, oh, great. Someone out there in the world is always sitting next to this guy at takeoff hearing the Lord's Prayer that, you know, makes you kind of wonder what's going to go on, right? But he's accepting the risk. He can mitigate the risk. <clears throat> mitigate the risk says, I get in my car, I'm a safe driver, I don't drive drunk, you know, all this other stuff, but I stop at stoplights, I wear my seatbelt, I have insurance, you know, I do what I need to mitigate the risk, even though I realize every time I get in my car, I may be in an accident. Or you transfer the risk, meaning I have insurance. I share the risk, I transfer the risk. It's the only four ways you can assess risk. Same thing, we're talking about cybersecurity, we're talking about business impact analysis, the same rules apply. Succession planning, okay, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I've been in a lot of small businesses uh, that depends on the key person at top, and they don't plan that, you know, they're ever going to die, go into a coma, or lose interest. Um, it's the same thing throughout uh, any kind of business system. Let's say in Harvey, say your systems are, are under a, a threat, you've got you've to get somebody in there, the water's rising, but, you know, your people can't get to work or your people are otherwise focused on their own personal situation, right? So succession planning in business, a lot of times we talk about death, disability, uh, losing interest, but in reality, succession planning just goes back to having redundancy in your workforce, having some kind of backup if a critical person cannot get there. Continuity of operations, you got to keep the business going. You got to keep the doors open, if nothing else, for reputation. Again, uh, my first company I ever started is still operating in College Station. Years ago, we were down on a South, what that time was South College Station, and uh, someone broke a phone cable and with a backhoe and then turned around and broke up the back, <laughs> cut the back up, and we had no phone service for two or three days. This was before cell phones. We uh, I had never planned for this to happen. I was a new business. I was, uh, you know, just finished my PhD at Texas A&M. <clears throat> I got to keep my business moving. <clears throat> what would you have done in my place? Well, what I did is I took our customer list, which wasn't that big because we tend to write uh, run big clients, and I sent people home to call from their phone on uh, 
to say, hey, we've, there's this major outage. It's affected hundreds of, so, but if you call, you're not going to get us. So we're in business. But what we couldn't do was the people that called and it was just told the phone was inoperable. So we did have some that we found out later, people who called us <clears throat> who were not existing clients who thought we had gone out of business, which basically we had for about three days. All right, disaster, excuse me, disaster recovery. Whether they're natural and caused by people can, uh, can destroy your operations, whether they're natural, you know, what doesn't make any difference. The result is the same. They are events that are not specifically aimed at your organization. They tend to have a wide scope. Uh, you know the devastation of Houston, Dickinson, these other areas that flooded. Uh, it's not like I could even, you know, my kids were going crazy, even though I told them not to. You know, they couldn't get to me to get me out of the, my flooded house. Um, if something had happened that I needed something, you know, my whole neighborhood was flooded. Um, stores had to close. You know, we, there was this impact for several days. So that's the, that's a disaster. Large focus. It's going to affect a large area. You may not be targeted. You're not going to be able to call on typical backup that you might if it had just been you in an isolated event. Again, you need the disaster recovery plan. I'm going to go quickly through these because I see <clears throat> probably losing interest in all my chit chat here. Uh, but this is what you do. What's what's the critical operations to keep your business going or to keep your enterprise going? Who do you need to do that? Look at this. Who, what, when, where, how, and why? When should this function be accomplished? How will it be performed? Uh, again, if you were in, uh, you, you might have payments that were due. Some some vendors are not forgiving if they don't get paid on time. They don't really care. Um, there's there's who's responsible. What do they need to do to perform the critical functions? When, where, and the like. <clears throat> Answering these questions, you create an initial draft, have it in writing, go back and review it, and you get, pro this says process and procedures needing to restore your operation, use checklist. Use, you know, a pilot, every time they get in a plane, they go through a checklist, do this, do this, do this, do this. They may have flown thousands of hours. Do the same thing. It's easy to overlook something. If you have a checklist, literally check it off. So critical, necessary, desirable. I think we're kind of getting through all this. We understand it. Um, you know, the differences again is that whether your operations continue, uh, that's caused the disruption, as opposed to you have a disaster, different scope. You have to plan for IT contingency. The cloud has made things so much easier. Uh, now, Emphasize, emphasize, emphasize. You need to test, exercise, and rehearse. If you're going to practice this, you need to have a plan in place and then simulate something happening. You don't have to actually go out and flood your premises, but you have to do maybe a tabletop. What if? Tabletop means you're going to put people on the table and say, okay, who's doing this? This is your job. You're doing this. We're simulating the event. Test, exercise, rehearse everything and everything you do in cybersecurity. And, oh, here it is. Look at this. Dr. Conklin agrees with me. Checklist, walkthrough, table tech exercise, functional test, full operational exercises. Uh, tabletop, I'll let you read through this. There's no big stuff here. We're going to end with these two terms, recovery time objective and recovery point objective. It's the time period for the RPO representing the maximum period of acceptable data loss. Now, you will talk, when we start talking about privacy in a few weeks, the chapter on privacy, you will find now that we are having legislation that says that acceptable time period is shrinking. Okay, if I can't, by law, by statute, by court decision, if I can't access something, we have become such a instantaneous, okay? The recovery time is the target time that is set for assumptions of operations. As I said before, and I want you to carry this with you as we close out video one. Our whole objective in this is to be able to keep the doors open, to be able to keep operational if it's a business continuity plan until we can fix the problem. If it's a disaster recovery plan, the critical operations until we can rebuild. We have to know how long it is before the data loss is no longer acceptable, either to our enterprise, to regulators, to vendors, to whatever, our stakeholders. 
and the recovery time, the target time that is set for resumption of operations after an incident. That's the end of the first video. Thank you for sticking with me. Second video coming up.